Michael here and this is the part two of the door tutorial that I'm going through today. Uh, so in the first episode we went through and created uh, this basic door setup here uh, that just opens and closes when uh, you press the uh, interact button when inside the uh, trigger volume. Okay, So in this particular, uh, this particular part here what we're actually going to be covering is how you could go about uh, having some form of uh, text pop up on the screen when the player is actually looking out the door and is obviously close enough uh, to interact with it. So in this case, inside the uh, the volume there. Uh, obviously, there's quite a few ways to to go about this, um, but the way we're going to do it is by using a line trace, um, so we can actually detect when the player is is looking out the uh, at the actual door. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is. Uh, go ahead and open up the uh, first person character uh, blueprint. Um, so obviously if you use the first person template yours should look similar to this. Uh, I have gone ahead and uh, disconnected the the fire there so we don't uh, get the loud noises and things like that uh, flying around drawing this particular uh, tutorial. Okay then. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do uh, is go ahead and just grab the tick. Uh, so that's the event tick uh, f coming from the uh, play character. Uh, the next thing we want to do is actually get the uh, line trace node. Okay, so there's actually uh, there's actually different types of line trace uh, as you can see from the list here. Uh, so the ones we're actually going to be wanting here is the line trace for objects. Um, so we're kind of going to go ahead and select that. Uh, you'll notice there's quite a few inputs for the the line trace. Uh, so the ob this particular node itself uh, is fairly. It looks a little bit confusing at first, but it's actually relatively uh, simple to to get functioning. Uh, so there are a few of these that are required. Um, also, the start here is where the line starts. And so for this particular case, I just want to go and just grab the uh, player's uh, location. Um, so, location, I believe, uh, should be under actor location. Uh, yep. uh, so, they get actor location, and what that will do, uh, it will get the sort of origin of the uh, character. So, that's dead center in this uh, capsule component. Uh, what we may need to do is at some point add like a little offset that, that does increase it uh, up to roughly where the head height is. Um, so what we want to do is get the actor location and then just do a, a plus vector. Uh, in this case, um, I just want to quickly check to see how far up it is. Um, so the FP gun, uh, which is what's used for the arms, and also the, uh, the mesh 2P uh, the gun's attached to, uh, just trying to see where that's located. Okay, so that's directly at the bottom. Okay, so we'll go ahead and just check the camera instead. Okay, so the camera is 64 units uh, from the centre here. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and add 64 units uh, to the Z. Uh, so that just moves the uh, the line trace uh, to start at where the axis location is plus 64 uh, on the Z there. So we're just going to just pull that straight in uh, to the start input. What we then want to do is actually go ahead and get the end point to where the, uh, we want the line trace to actually go to. And this little, this bit's uh, a little bit more complicated uh, at first, as we do actually need to get a normal uh, for where the, the player's, sort of the direction the player's looking in. Uh, so what we can actually do for this uh, is get what we refer to as the forward vector. Okay, uh, so get forward vector. So then what we want to do is get the player's rotation. Uh, rotation. Like so. And we'll just pull that into the forward rotation. And what this will do, it'll convert the rotation that it inputs into a forward vector. Uh, so it'll work out what the direction of the... It pretty much works out the direction that the particular actor is, is facing. Uh, in terms of a sort of an XYZ grid. Okay, uh, uh, so what we then want to do is take that uh, vector uh, and then we want to actually multiply it. And when we're multiplying, what we're actually doing here is 
uh, giving that particular uh, vector a length. Um, uh, so for this example, obviously if we put 100 in there, obviously it'll, uh, the line itself would be uh, 100 uh, units long. Uh, in this case, I believe that would be a, uh, 1 metre uh, with the UE4 uh, system. Uh, what I'm actually going to do is just promote that to a variable um, and just call that trace distance. So this just allows us to uh, easily change uh, how far the, the line trace actually goes. Uh, I'm just going to quickly compile that. Uh, sorry, set to 100. So I'm just going to go ahead and leave that at what it is for now. What we then need to do is actually add this value here to this one. Because uh, this particular value here is actually a normalized value. Because um, the get forward vector uh, only works from, only gives the values between minus 1 and 1. And that sort of controls uh, the direction uh, that, it's, that it's looking at. Uh, so what we want to do is take the the starting point for our our line trace and we want to add uh, the second one. And once we've done that, we should go and just put that straight into the end uh, on the on the line trace there. Uh, the next thing we need uh, is the object types. Um, so this is actually required. So what I'm actually going to do is go ahead and just make an array and uh, just put it straight off like so. And we'll actually be able to get some options in here. And the things I actually want to trace for in this particular example is just the world dynamic. Uh, so this is anything that's uh, set to movable, uh, as it will, was in the world. Uh, so anything that's static that uh, see it won't it won't cause a trace uh, on that particular object. Uh, also, there are a few other things you can do. Also, the trace complex. In this case, we are going to just leave that unchecked. Um, uh, you also have the actors to ignore, so you could specify certain actors that it wouldn't uh, trigger against. Um, we also have some debug options, and this just uh, displays the actual line for the trace. Uh, so we're actually going to set that to uh, for one frame. That just allows us to check to make sure the trace is actually going from where we want it to to, to the end point. Uh, and the final one here is obviously the ignore self. So we want to go ahead and just make sure that's checked as well. Uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and pull that straight into the event tick there. Uh, so that just causes it to fire every uh, every tick. Uh, so that now it's compiled and saved. Uh, and now I'm just going to go through and test. Uh, okay, so at this point I can't actually see the line trace. Okay, so I'm not quite sure what's happening there. Okay then. Okay. Okay, so the world dynamics, it should be coming out for frame. Okay, I'm just going to set that for duration, and I'll see if it's showing up. Um, okay, there we go. So we can actually see where the line trace is now. Um, as we're moving around, you can see where it's coming. Okay, so at this point, the line trace itself does seem to be a little bit high, because you know, it's not actually really going to where the cursor is. Uh, so what I'm going to do at this particular point uh, is I'm actually just going to drop that to zero and just see where that lines. Uh, okay, so it does seem a lot better, but it looks like we need to just increase the trace distance a little bit there. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and set that to uh, try 300, so that should be about 3 metres. Uh, so as you can see, um, it is tracing. But you probably notice now it's actually hitting the uh, the trigger box on the on the doors. And so that's something we're going to have to uh, obviously deal with in a moment, and I'll go ahead and show how to do that as well. Um, but the 300 does seem a little bit far, so I'm just going to quickly drop that to the 200. Okay, um, mm -hmm. one last quick test. Yeah, so 200 seems uh, seems reasonable there. Okay, so the next thing I'm actually going to deal with here is the fact that the uh, the line trace itself is interacting with the, the trigger volume we have on the doors. Uh, so in this particular case, I'm just going to go ahead and open the uh, door blueprint. And I want to go to the viewport tab. And I want to actually select the trigger from the components panel. Uh, okay, so anything that you add to 
uh, your world uh, obviously has some collision settings. So under the details panel, you just want to with the trigger select, you want to scroll down to the trigger, uh, sorry, to the collision uh, options, uh, and you'll notice there's some collision presets here. You just want to go ahead and drop that down, uh, and you want to set it to uh, overlap only pawn. And what this does um, is it means that the trigger volume itself will only fire the overlap events uh, when a pawn interacts with it. So in that case that's the player. Uh, so it's not going to interact with any, any other objects or anything like that. Uh, so now if you noticed it's still not doing anything. Okay. Okay, let's so bear with this check why that's not doing what it should be. Bit tight while dynamic. Okay, bit tight. Okay, I'm just going to try that as well static for a moment, just bear with me. Okay, yeah, so as you've, as you've noticed here, uh, even with it being set to world uh, static, it's not actually interacting with the, the doors, uh, with them being movable. Okay, so I'm going to a quick look at these. So we'll dynamic. Um, Um, okay, so we're going to set these all to ignore, except for the pawn um, uh, on the trigger there. Okay, in the collision settings, let's see if that makes a difference. Okay, so it's still not uh, functioning. Okay then, uh, so I'm not quite sure why that is the case. If you bear with me, I'm just going to quickly pause the uh, video whilst I quickly figure this out. So I'll try and okay, yep, so I'm back now. Let's see, so it took me a few minutes to figure out what was uh, causing the issue there. Uh, so like in the door blueprint, uh, what we also needed to do uh, under the trigger is actually just change the object type um, from world dynamic to pawn. Um, in some scenarios like this, the, the line trace itself uh, actually ignores the collision types on the uh, on the trigger here. Uh, this is only interested in anything that's world dynamic. Um, so by changing that object type to pawn, um, it means that the, the line trace itself doesn't pick it up. Now uh, you could try changing it to some of the other ones, uh, but pawn seems like the uh, the one that's that functions without uh, causing any, any weird sort of side effects. Um, okay, yep, so just so we can see how this looks now. Uh, so also when we jump into the, the level, as you can see the trace no longer collides with the, uh, the actual trigger volume, but it does hit the, the actual door um, going around. And at the moment, obviously, you can still interact with the trigger using the uh, the there. Okay. Uh, okay, so if we go jump back in here again, you probably notice that the, the actual line trace isn't following the direction of my uh, pointer, uh, so where I'm actually aiming. Uh, so ideally what we need to do is actually get an end point that's, that's relative to my, my, the direction I'm looking in. Uh, so what we're going to do is jump back into the uh, first person character. And uh, what we need to do is actually adjust uh, the get forward uh, sort of vector there. Okay. Uh, so, what we can actually do. Okay. Um, sorry about the shortcut there. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so, what we actually need to do here uh, to obviously get the. Uh, to get the line trace to actually go to where uh, the player is looking is actually change the rotation we're actually inputting into the the forward vector. Uh, so what we're actually doing is just getting the actor uh, rotation, uh, which is for the the root of the player. Uh, so in this case, it'll be the con capsule component, and the capsule component itself, uh, it, the only thing it actually does is, is just rotates along the yaw, um, which unfortunately isn't obviously ideal uh, in this scenario. Uh, so what we can actually do, uh, if we actually 
get the camera instead, and we actually get the rotation of that. Uh, rotation. And plug that into there instead. Let's delete that one. And it should give us uh, the desired uh, result. Okay. So as you can see now, so obviously the, the line trace itself is actually following or moving in the direction that uh, it's actually looking at, uh, which is obviously extremely useful if you've got like, the buttons or anything like that that you want to uh, get the player to uh, aim at. Now obviously you may need to do some slight adjustments to, to get it to line up perfectly with the, the centre of the screen um, uh, there, but obviously I'm not going to be covering this in this particular tutorial. Uh, for this particular example obviously this is uh, obviously more than sufficient. Okay, then, uh, so so the next thing I want to do now uh, is take a look at the actual, uh, also the next, the outputs, uh, the sort of return values on the, on the line trace here. Uh, so the first one I want to look at is obviously the return value. Uh, so I want to quickly go off, uh, come off it and just grab a branch. Uh, what this is going to do, if, if the line trace actually hits something, it will return a value of, of true. If it doesn't, it will return a value of false. Um, and this, this just means that it doesn't do any of the checks uh, if it doesn't actually hit anything. Uh, so the next thing we want to do is on the on hit, if we pull from that, we actually want to go ahead and break the hit result. Uh, and what that will do, it will give us a ton of, of options uh, as you can see here. Uh, and this is a lot, uh, this is sort of information all about the, the particular th actor that the, uh, the line trace has actually hit. Okay, uh, so ideally what we actually want to do, we want to get the hit actor. Uh, so that's the, the actor that we've actually hit. Uh, so ideally what we need to do uh, is get some information about that particular actor. Um, which obviously we can get from uh, just by pulling off of here. Um, but before we actually move on to uh, obviously doing anything with the hit actor, uh, obviously we need to set up something um, to actually display uh, the text that we want on the screen. Uh, so for now, just obviously compile and save the blueprint, and uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, so if you want to go back to your do, uh, so what I'm going to do is just go ahead and create a new folder in the uh, door tutorial uh, folder. There. I'm just going to call this UI, uh, and then in there, I'm going to go down to the user interface and just create a brand new uh, widget blueprint. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to go ahead and call this main, uh, like so, and just go ahead and save that. Uh, and, okay, and I'm just going to actually go ahead and create a, a second one uh, for this widget, and uh, this is going to be uh, display text. Like so, and I'm going to go ahead and save that as well. Uh, so I'm actually going ahead and opened up the display text, and I'm going to delete the canvas panel. Okay, um, uh, so the reason why is uh, the, the canvas panel, uh, I'll quickly demonstrate. If you used to go ahead and create a button, you can freely move that and position it where you want within the canvas panel and, and scale it. Uh, for this particular example, it's not actually what we're wanting uh, from this particular uh, widget. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and add a horizontal box uh, instead. Uh, so if you look at the hierarchy on the left hand side there, you can see it's just the horizontal box. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is go ahead and add a text field. Uh, from the common uh, drop down. Uh, so it's nested inside of the, the horizontal box. Now, what I'm going to go ahead and do is set the horizontal and vertical alignments to centre uh, and just set the size to fill. And that should just centre the whole, whole thing there. Um, okay, uh, also, there are a few ways you can uh, do this. Uh, obviously, you could always set your horizontal alignment to uh, horizontally aligned fill as well, so you'll end up with sort of an extended box like this. Um, depending on uh, obviously what it is your the way you're going to be using this particular widget, you may need to obviously play around with these to, to get it to display correctly uh, for your particular project. Um, okay, so 24 should be fine. It's a nice size. Um, the colour is white. Okay, so it looks like all the other settings here should be fine. Uh, Okay, so the next thing I want to do is actually uh, name this particular text box. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and call, uh, just rename under the details at the top here. Let's call it text uh, display. Uh, and I just want to go ahead and check the is variable as well. 
Uh, swing technique is variable uh, option up here. What it actually means is when you go into the graph view, let's quickly delete those, uh, under the variables tab you will actually get a reference to that uh, particular text uh, element that you've added to your, your, in your designer view uh, to the work, uh, workspace. Uh, so the next thing we want to do uh, is actually set up a function that would allow us to update the text that's displayed in here. Uh, so you want to go to the functions, uh, you should go and click the new function, uh, and for this I'm just going to call it uh, update uh, display uh, text, like so. Uh, you notice it automatically open in the uh, function there. If it hasn't, you can just double click on it in the functions list and it should open uh, like so. The next thing I'm going to do is just grab a reference to the uh, display text. Uh, and I'm going to pull from that reference and add a set text uh, node like so. And I'm just going to connect that up. Okay, uh, so this particular node here it does require uh, an input. So what I'm going to do, uh, with it being a function, I want to be able to pass uh, the text I want to display into the function. Uh, so selecting the, the initial node there, uh, if you uh, under the details, under the inputs, if you click new, uh, let's call this text and for the type you want to select text as well and you can just drag that and connect it up like so and just for the sake of it, I'm just going to add a return node like so. Uh, so with a return node you can obviously add additional outputs so you can always have something coming out um, to check whether or not it was successfully set or something along those lines. In this example uh, I don't think uh, I'm not going to uh, so that's fine Okay, so in regards to this particular display text, um, this widget itself is now complete. Um, uh, and the final thing I'm going to do, uh, just for leave, is just actually just clear out the text there, just so it's empty. Uh, so even though there's nothing in there, uh, obviously it still is displayed. So, and once you've done that, just compile and save. And uh, you can actually go ahead and close that widget blueprint there. Uh, the next thing I want to do is actually go back to your content browser and just open up the main widget. Uh, so this is uh, obviously a blank widget uh, with the standard canvas panel by default. Uh, so we're actually going to be using the canvas panel this time. Uh, and what you want to do under your, your palette where all your various options are, if you scroll all the way to the bottom you should see user created. Uh, and in there should be the widget you just created for the display text. Uh, so what you want to do is go and actually add that to your, uh, to your canvas panel. Uh, so this will, uh, this this should display, uh, well this will display the uh, some text uh, when you actually update the, uh, we'll call the update uh, text function inside this particular widget here. Uh, so the next thing I want to do is just go ahead and quickly position that. So I'm just going to change the anchors uh, to the centre there, and just set the position uh, X and Y. Okay, uh, to zero, and you'll notice that it does actually snap to the top left of this particular widget. Uh, I do want it uh, centered, uh, particularly on the x axis. So, under the alignment, if you change that to 0.5, uh, it will actually change the pivot point uh, for this particular widget to the center. Uh, what we can then do uh, is just go and just move, move it down to to where you'd like it uh, to be displayed. Um, in this example, I'm just going to do it about, uh, say, 300. That should be fine. And then I'm going to go ahead and check the size to content. Because um, sometimes this, sometimes you, you may need this on, sometimes you may need it off. Um, but in theory, uh, when we update the text, it should automatically resize uh, this particular widget uh, size to obviously wrap around uh, whatever's inside of it. Uh, so at this point this widget itself is done, so I'll go and just uh, obviously compile and save that. Uh, uh, yep. So the reason why we've done it this way and added that widget into this main one uh, is so obviously if we had things like uh, health bars and things like that, we can also place these in here and they can also be their own separate uh, widgets that obviously have their own uh, functions inside them to, to obviously update the, uh, the actual uh, displays for them. Um, uh, obviously in this particular tutorial, obviously we won't be going through that, uh, so we can actually go and just close out of the main uh, widget now. Uh, so the final thing we need to do uh, is actually spawn in the widget. Uh, so I've jumped back into the first person blueprint, just to make a little bit of space. 
Uh, I'm going to go ahead and add a begin event, uh, begin event play node. Uh, so this will fire uh, once at the very beginning when this particular act is spawned. Uh, and what we're going to do is create a widget. Like so. Uh, from the, the for the class, you want to go ahead and select the widget main. Now, so this is the main widget that you want to display. Uh, obviously, you may have named your something else. That's not a problem. Just kind of select the one that you want to to be displayed there. Okay, uh, and then for the owning player, we do actually need to get a reference to the player controller. Uh, so you're going to get that. Uh, yep, uh, so what this will do, it will create the uh, the widget, uh, and then it will assign it to the, the the player controller that you've inputted there. Okay, so the next thing I actually want to do is store a reference to the uh, the actual uh, widget. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to call this a UI ref. Uh, uh, for reference, if you don't actually create a a reference to this like this, you will actually lose the reference to the widget altogether. Uh, it can be very difficult to get a reference to a created widget if you haven't stored the return value, uh, which is why I'm just doing that now. Uh, also, you can compile. Okay. Uh, also, the UI ref will be it'll have none initially, but once obviously it spawns this. Here, widget in it will populate uh, the UI ref with the the reference we'll we'll need. Uh, so the next thing we want to do is actually go ahead and add that to the viewport, and this just takes the widget and says, "Hey, here's a widget. Display it on screen for me." Uh, there is a Z order, so if you've got multiple widgets uh, overlaying each other, you can just go through and change the the order in which they're they're stacked on top of each other. Uh, because we've only got one widget, we don't need to worry about it. actually if it's zero. Okay. Uh, so just to test to make sure that's actually being displayed, uh, I'm just going to go into the display text and just quickly set this to some sample uh, text, like so. Uh, yep, so if we go into our game, obviously you see the sample text being displayed at the bottom there. Uh, so that's great. Uh, so now we know that's being uh, spawned and obviously set to load on the screen there. I'm just going to clear out the uh, uh, the text that's displayed there now. Uh, that just means that when the when you first spawn in the level uh, and the widget gets placed, there's nothing, no text on the screen. <coughs> okay. Okay. So the next thing we want to do now is okay. Is go to the door. Uh, so what we can actually do, uh, the door itself does have two states. Um, uh, so what we actually need to do is, when the player is looking at the door, uh, we want to be able to obviously update the text uh, that's being displayed uh, based on what it is that we're looking at. Um, there are a few ways to do this, uh, and the way I'm going to choose to do it is by using a blueprint interface. Uh, so you want to go back to your content browser, uh, and you want to go ahead and go to the blueprints and create a blueprint interface. Uh, so for this, I'm going to call it BPI um, uh, Interact. Like so, uh, save that. Uh, you want to go ahead and open that up, and the first thing to obviously get you to do is, is to automatically create one function. Uh, so what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to call this uh, looking at, like so, and just compile and save. Okay, so the next thing we need to do uh, is actually set our blueprints to actually use this blueprint interface. Uh, obviously a blueprint interface, you can have multiple functions, uh, and anything that is referring to the, the blueprint interface can use um, and have those those functions in them. Uh, so what I want to do is go to the, the blueprint door uh, and you want to go to the class defaults. Oh, no, sorry, uh, you want to go to the class settings. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, and on the details panel, uh, there should be a section that says interfaces. And on the inter implement and interfaces, you want to kind of click add and add your BPI interact. And you just want to compile and save. Uh, and what this actually does uh, if we actually now right click in here, uh, the uh, looking at uh, should now appear, both as a, an event and a call function. 
Uh, so I'll probably love all that in a moment. Uh, but if you don't do the uh, add the interface there, those won't actually show up. And the next thing we want to do is actually add that to our first person character as well. So it again, so class settings. Um, under the interfaces and the details, you want to add the BPI interact. Okay, so that's great. Okay then, uh, so the next thing we want to do uh, is obviously actually use this interface we've just created. So I'm going to go and grab the old King Yards, like so. Uh, and what we actually do is want to call the function. Uh, yep, so from the, the branch that we created earlier, coming off of the line trace, we connect that to the true. Uh, so if the line trace successfully hits an object, it will go ahead and call the uh, the looking at function there. Uh, but the looking at that actually needs a target. Uh, so it's where where is it going to be calling this interface? And um, what we can actually go ahead and do is just grab from the hit actor uh, or not uh, target. Okay, yes. okay so if you bear with me. Okay, so it looks like if you pull from the hit actor and do the looking at, uh, it looks like it's the message one we're, we're needing there. I have to do apologise for that. Uh, so what that will do, it will take the hit actor and it will look in the actor and say do you, know, do you have this looking at uh, function implemented, if so call it for me. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, compile and save that and then I'm just going to quickly jump to the, blue, uh, the, the door blueprint and we actually want to implement that uh, uh, looking at event. Uh, so under the, uh, the add event uh, you should see that there, so looking at and you should get a node like this and it will say underneath it from BPI Interact so obviously that's that blueprint interface uh, that we created um, so whenever uh, this here gets triggered it will take the actor uh, to try and find this event and if it finds it it will uh, fire it uh, okay that's what we can now do uh, is go ahead and set up what we want it to do. Okay. Yep, so we can. So the first thing we want to do is get this door open. Because obviously if the door is open we want it to say close and if the door is closed we want it to say open. Um, so I'm actually going to use a select for that, like so. Uh, I'm just going to go and create two new variables. Uh, these will both be text. Um, close uh, message. And that wants to be a text. I'm actually going to quickly change that to message closed. And I'm going to add another one. This will be message open. Let's uh, quickly compile and save. Uh, so in the defaults, I'm just going to go for the closed. I'm going to change that to say open, and then in brackets uh, e. Uh, to symbolise that you can obviously open the door if you press e. Uh, for the open message, I'm going to do close open brackets e like so. Compile and save. And then we can just actually plug these. Uh, get a reference to these like so. So dot open is true. Uh, close false like so. That's so what this will do. It'll just choose which text it will use uh, depending on what state the door is currently in. Uh, so the door is open, it'll show the open message. Uh, and if the door is closed, it'll show the closed message. Okay, uh, so what we actually need to do now, so we're nearly uh, nearly finished. The next thing we actually need to do is, is get a reference to our UI uh, reference that's in the player there. Uh, so what we should be able to do is get pawn, like so. Okay, and the pawn uh, reference that we actually get is just a standard pawn reference. And uh, what we actually need to do is go ahead and cast to our first person character. So it's typing cast, and you should be able to see the first person character. And what that does, if you hover over the references, uh, you will see uh, sort of the type of uh, reference that it is, or the variable it is. Uh, so pawn here is just a pawn reference, uh, and once, once you cast it, it converts it uh, to a different one. 
Uh, obviously, when you're casting, it will only convert uh, if the particular thing you're trying to cast to is a part of uh, the the hierarchy, as it were. Uh, so the first person character is built upon top of the pawn, uh, which allows you to convert the pawn or cast the pawn to the first person character. Uh, so we're going to put that into the event looking at. And then if we pull from the first person character at the bottom here, uh, if we scroll to the bottom there, we should be able to see the list of all the variables uh, that we've created. So we should be able to get the UI ref uh, reference. Okay. And if we pull from there, we should hopefully be able to grab our widget as well that we have that we placed in there. Okay. Yep. Uh, obviously, if you are spawning your widgets in dynamically, you may have to do this a little bit differently. Okay. And then if we drag from that, we should be able to call the update display function. Like so. And then we'll just connect our text from our select, like that. Uh, and at this point, we should be done. Uh, so let's go ahead and just test that. Yep. So if we're looking at the door, it should say close. So if it's open, close, like so. So the issue we've got at the moment, if uh, we're not looking at anything, uh, obviously the text still remains upon the screen. Uh, so what we need to do now, uh, is on the trace we want to call our UI ref uh, get our main widget and get the display and we just want to call that function again the update text and we just want to leave that blank uh, if the if the actual trace is false that means if it's not hit anything uh, it's going to set that text to uh, nothing uh, as it were. Okay, so we're just going to compile that. And now if we do it, yep, so we can close if we're looking at the door. If we look away, uh, it disappears. Okay. Yep. So that's how we get the uh, the text to display. Uh, so at the moment you've probably noticed the door itself is still uh, interacting even though we're not actually looking at the door. Okay. So at this point what we can do uh, quite easily uh, obviously with the event looking at, we can add one last variable. Uh -huh. Okay, just bear with me, let's quickly figure out the best way to do this. Door looking at... Uh, Okay, yeah, so we'll pull off of here, just add another uh, off the the main interact button. So this is the uh, uh, the key binding that we did in the first uh, part. Uh, so you want to drag from that and just add another branch. Uh, all we want to do is prompt to a variable, and this is going to be uh, uh, player looking. Uh, like so. Uh, note there. Okay, uh, so what this is going to do, it means that if the variable is false, the player's not looking at it, it won't actually progress uh, to actually change the state of the door. Uh, so what we can actually do now is on the event look at, if the player is looking at the door, we can set the uh, that value to true. Okay, like so. And the final thing that we need to do uh, is obviously set the player looking uh, to false. Uh, so what we can actually do here um, is get a reference to the hit actor when we're looking at it. So I'm just going to promote that to, ver to a variable uh, and say call that looking at uh, uh, actor. 
looking at. Uh, so when that's true, it will store reference to it. Uh, I'm just going to quickly just put that into there, like so, just to make things look a little bit tidier. Okay, just to make that look a little bit tidier. Okay, so now when uh, the player looks at something, it will store reference to that particular actor uh, temporarily. Uh, so that way, because uh, obviously if this is false, uh, obviously it's not it's not hit anything, so the hit actor here would be uh, would be null. Uh, so what we can do is we store a reference to it there. We can then set the text to zero, and then from here, we get. Um, we can actually then set the looking at. Uh, where do I need to cast this? Uh, it looks like I do. Um, Okay, uh, let's see, yes, what we can do now instead, if we go to the door, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, back to the blueprint interface, uh, and under the looking at, we add an input, and we can actually call that uh, looking at, uh, uh, set that to a boolean, and we'll compile and save that. If we go back to the door and the first person, you notice that there is now a, a boolean on that particular uh, input there. Uh, so what we can actually do uh, is just set the player looking at there, like so. Uh, we just need to quickly copy this down here. Uh, the reason why is because if we don't, uh, if the player looking at is false, uh, it'll still set the text uh, which we don't want. Uh, so by looking at true, and get that back up there, like so. Uh, okay, so yeah, I'll just do a straight line like so, just make things nice and tidy. So what we can now do, uh, if we go back to the first person, uh, we can just go ahead and so to, to tick get the looking at interface again. Uh, the reason why I'm using the interface also is because it means we don't need to cast to a specific class, uh, which means that m different types of classes can implement the looking at um, uh, interface, which means you don't have to convert the actor and, and cast to a different uh, function there. Okay, and just to make things a little bit tidier, I'm just going to swap these around. Uh, in this particular case, the order doesn't matter. Okay. Like so. Okay, so we just save and compile that. Uh, I'll just quickly double check to make sure everything's fine. Uh, yep. Okay then, so now if we go and test it. Uh, unless we're physically looking at the door, uh, it won't actually open. Uh, but if you're looking at the door, uh, it will will now interact with it. So in this example here, you can obviously it does work with the door frames. Uh, you could obviously go into detail and obviously select uh, actors to exclude and, and things like that. Uh, but normally something like this, it's, it's perfectly fine. Uh, uh, obviously, the great thing about this particular method uh, is you just going to quickly duplicate this. Uh, so door two. Uh, so you could go ahead and obviously make multiple door types. Uh, just save. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and quickly change the material on the door. Okay. So also did. Yeah, it looks like a uh, there we go. Yeah, so I'm just going to quickly just change the material on the door there. Uh, just something so we can distinguish it. Uh, something a bit nicer. Uh, uh, there we go. Something like that. So if we were to place that in the level also. Uh, so you can have multiple doors, and also I've just literally duplicated the door. Um, and this 
this could be any other actor uh, that has some form of uh, functionality when the, the player interacts with it. Uh, but obviously we go back to the actual blueprint, uh, so door 2. Uh, we can go ahead and actually change the, the messages here. Um, so, uh, open maybe. Like so. Uh, maybe close maybe. Like so. Let's compile and save. Uh, so at the moment we have two door blueprints that have completely different messages uh, in the uh, save there. So obviously if we go back to this first one we did. Obviously it says close and open. And we've come over to the second one. Uh, obviously just by changing those particular inputs there, uh, very quickly able to adjust the messages for different types. Uh, what you could also do, um, as another example, is you can actually set these uh, to editable. Uh, I'm just going to check the editable and, uh, uh, editable and expose and spawn for the message closed and the uh, message open, like so. Uh, I'm just going to ignore the door 2 for now. I just don't need that. Uh, and when we do that, what it will actually do is, on the blueprint, it will actually open up the messages, uh, the, the variables in the defaults tab here. Uh, so we can actually set, even though it, these three here are the same blueprint, uh, we can say open middle door close middle door and the first one we could go um, open wrong door and close wrong door and if we go in and play uh, they should all have their own different messages for both the open and close state. Uh, obviously, this is all obviously easily customizable with this uh, with this setup there. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned, you could easily quite easily just duplicate the the doors, uh, the door blueprints uh, for for varieties. Obviously, there's other ways to do it also, uh, which uh, we will actually cover in our part three. Uh, of this. Uh, so that pretty much wraps up the this tutorial here on how to implement uh, some form of, of UI display, sort of text display when you're trying to interact with your doors there. Uh, obviously if you liked the video and found it useful, obviously click the like button. Uh, if you have any comments, obviously leave a comment in the comments section below. Uh, so yeah, thank you for watching and have a great day.